Thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, so today I'd like to tell you about our work in looking at um, ribozyme catalysis inside of complex coacerbates. And I'm going to describe how this is uh, assisted by anions. And so we just heard a little bit about protocells and how those could come about from um, complex coacerbates. And we've been studying this in the lab for, for several years now. This is a, a collaboration with the Keating Lab. And some of the first work that we published looks at the um, coacervation between a polycation polyallylamine uh, and a oligoanion ATP. And when these come together by um, uh, associative uh, phase separation to make a liquid-liquid phase separation. And these um, form, get this, got cut off a little bit here. Um, there should be a picture here of coacervates, and then uh, these are enriched with certain um, species that are favorable for, for ribozyme reactions, such as enhanced concentrations of magnesium ions, nucleotides, and RNA oligomers. And I'm going to show you uh, a story today which we recently published uh, just a few weeks ago, came out in ACS Chemical Biology, uh, in which we have coacervates. And, and in these are uh, ribozymes, or RNA enzymes, which are shown in green. And they go from this misfolded state where they're associated with the uh, polycation, and that we can rescue their activity by adding oligoanions that can displace these and allow these to fold. Um, so <laughs> condensates. Uh, are formed by liquid-liquid phase separation, and they're common in modern cells. And so here is a, an image from um, uh, Cliff um, Brangwine's lab showing uh, phase separation, and this is with uh, the uh, unstructured uh, region of the laf helicase. And these come together to form these, uh, these condensates, which are on the, the micron um, size um, scale. And we can make these in the lab as well. So these are uh, association in this case this is uh, um, between um, spermine and a um, poly U, as well as we can have them in which, um, they're, uh, in which the poly uh, cation is, is the uh, polymer. Uh, and these give, um, these give compartments that are similar uh, on their size scale and the microns um, scale to the ones that are found in vivo. And in order to form these condensates, some of the features that are important are polyelectrolytes, um, unstructured peptide domains, Crowders and co-solutes, as well as it depends on the pH ions and um, temperature. And uh, recently, um, we published a, a review on this in biochemistry, in which um, we see to see a number of processes that are important that could emerge for RNA function uh, in an RNA world um, scenario. And those are the concentration of nucleotides that can happen, and then function in terms of um, non-enzymatic. Uh, these are templated. Um, polymerization reactions, as well as ribozyme reactions. And then we also get the concentration, not only of the nucleotides, but also of the longer RNAs, which are enriched and encapsulated within the protocell, and these shorter ones, which are, are less, uh, less so in that, in that sense. And um, I just want to point out that <clears throat> a lot of the work, much of the work I'm going to talk about today is the work from a, a postdoc in our lab, um, Dr. Uh, Raghav Padayal, and he will be speaking um, on Thursday on template-directed RNA polymerization and enhanced ribozyme catalysis inside of membrane compartments um, formed by coacervates. So we're going to use um, ribozymes in order to look at function inside of, inside of complex coacervates as models um, for protocells. And one of the reasons to look at ribozymes is we're interested in whether or not RNA can fold into a functional form inside of these uh, coacervates. And ribozymes are ideal for that because they reveal their folding through the self-cleavage and their enzymatic activity. Plus, RNA activity um, and reactions are of an intrinsic interest to the RNA world um, uh, scenario. So uh, this begins to show uh, the process of, of in, in a mechanistic way, in the absence of coacervates that are going to help us understand in some way about how coacervates themselves promote the reaction. And it's a fairly simple reaction, which we can understand through kind of a michaelis menten type of, um, of formula that's shown here. These are under single turnover conditions, meaning that the substrate is in limiting amounts. In this particular example, it's radio labeled, and it can associate with the enzyme to make a complex that we can look at on a native page. 
This is a particular case where the reaction is prevented from advancing because at the cleavage site here for the hammerhead ribozyme, there's actually a deoxy which uh, removes the nucleophile in the reaction. And we can see that as we increase the enzyme um, concentration that it shifts the limiting uh, amount of the limiting reagent of the substrate up to this uh, higher uh, mobility species which is the enzyme substrate um, complex. And we can plot this, uh, the fraction of the substrate that's bound as a function of enzyme concentration. And we can see that in order to get most of the substrate bound, it takes a, an increasing amount of um, enzyme concentration as, as uh, we're all familiar with. And the question is then how does a similar type of reaction happen inside of coacervates? So these are coacervates that are made from a quaternary uh, amine um, polymer, um, polydiolyl dimethyl ammonium chloride, which is a 53-mer. And we're going to bring this together with some oligoaspartic acids that are of varying length from 10 out to um, 100 um, monomeric units. And here you can see in the DIC image that these uh, coacervates are forming and that they're on the micron scale and that these also encapsulate the ribozyme. And so if the enzyme strand is labeled with a fluorescine, you can see that it's enriched in the same um, droplets here, again, on the micron scale. And what's important is that if we take this and we make a calibration curve in solution, we can see that the concentration from the dilute or bulk phase into the coacervates is quite large. It's increased about 5,000 times. Um, so if we add only 10, 10 nanomolar of, of the enzyme, it's enriched up to 44 um, micromolar. <clears throat> and so, um, so now we'll go in and we'll look at the effect of different um, lengths of the oligoaspartic acid from 10 to 30, 50, and 100 mers. And in this particular assay, the polycation and polyanion are allowed to come together at charged matched uh, conditions of one to one. Um, and then the, first the uh, enzyme is introduced and then the substrate is introduced and we'll look at the reaction that happens. And this is again with a radio labeled um, substrate. And so when reaction happens, it goes from this higher mobility species down to the product here, from the unreacted to the cleaved. So these are now denaturing page gels. And what we can see that is if the reaction is done in buffer, and these are done under conditions, under so-called K-CAT over KM conditions, though, so that it, even though the enzyme is in excess, it's far below the, the, um, the KD for the reaction. So there's very little reaction out to 30 minutes. But that as we bring in the, um, the coacervate, we begin to see uh, more and more cleave product form. And then we can look at and plot the um, amount of product that's formed at 30 minutes as a function of the length of the uh, anion in these coacervates. And we can see that we get an increase and in that, there, that there's a, a certain range of the uh, length of the polyanion that's optimal, or what I'm calling a so-called um, Goldilocks effect. So if it's too short, the reaction's not as good, and if it's too long, it's also not as good. So we wanted to delve into what could be the mechanistic basis for this. And so the first thing we did was to look at the encapsulation of the um, ribozyme. In this case, we're looking at the encapsulation of the substrate into coacervates that come from the different lengths of the polyanions. And you can see, somewhat paradoxically, that the, the shorter um, polyanion of the tenmer has greater encapsulation than the longer one does, even though this is one of the uh, shorter reaction rates. And so if we plot this out, these, these colors, and in all the slides are, are color matched, um, <clears throat> you can see indeed that there's less um, substrate, less substrate um, encapsulated uh, inside of the, um, inside of the um, uh, coacervate. And so what seems to be happening is that the larger polyanions are preventing uptake of the ribozyme because the larger polyanions are strongly associated with the cations. Um, but on the other hand, here in the shorter um, polyanions, the ribozyme goes in more, more readily, but it associates so strongly with, with the polycations that it's probably not in the correct fold. So having made this observation, we then came up with the idea that we perhaps could stimulate that reaction by adding even more polyanions. And so here's the effect of adding excess um, polyanions, and you'll see that excess short polyanions actually enhance catalysis. And so, um, so you can see here, this is now in the case of the, of the D10, if we go away from charge match conditions to a two-fold up to five-fold excess of the um, oligoanion, you can see that the rate of the reaction is enhanced up to um, two-fold more. 
And now this is a chart of the, of the various um, uh, encapsulation of the um, enzyme under these various conditions. And the two most optimal conditions for catalysis are with the excess uh, charge on, on the um, D10 as well as then with the w charge matched on the D50. And you can see that they have similar uptake, kind of modest uptake, in which it kind of um, finds that sort of magic zone between being uptake somewhat, uh, the, the RNA being up taken up into the coacervate somewhat, but not um, so strongly that it's misfolded. So then we wanted to see whether these effects are general, which would make them kind of more robust in an early Earth uh, scenario. So the next thing we did was move away from biogenic to abiogenic um, carboxylates, at going from 30 to 45, and we can see that the reaction in 45 is also much enhanced over the buffer. If we go a little bit shorter in the 25 mer, we can see the rate is, is not as high and the charge matched. But again, if we add excess polyanion, just like we saw in the other case, that the rate is enhanced, but if we add too much, that the rate starts to come back down. <coughs> to further test the general, um, um, generality of, of this mechanism, we then looked at these polyanion-assisted um, catalysis and asked whether other polyanions that, that might be present um, and to test the robustness of this, would all, whether these could also stimulate the reaction. So we test this with sulfates and phosphates and the first thing is if we look at phosphates, by adding the uh, excess um, anion as, as RNA and a phosphate, you can see that the rate is stimulated. This is by adding uh, half of an equivalent excess of the, of the polyanion. It also works with sulfate, and here this is heparin, and this also enhances the reaction. So then in the last um, data slide that I have, we're gonna test whether excess polyanions polyanions can rescue RNA catalysis in otherwise incompatible complex coacervates. And so we start here, and rather, rather than starting with the, the oligoaspartic acid um, interacting weakly with a quaternary amine, we let it interact strongly with, with um, oligoarginine, in which there's very little reaction. And you can see that as you add um, increasing amounts of the oligoarginine that the, the reaction increases. And so the first thing, again, is as we move from the um, quaternary amine to the um, oligoarginine, the rate drops tenfold, but then as we add in up to threefold excess of the oligoarginine, the rate is, re is rescued and it increases back up twelvefold. So, um, so quite strikingly, these, this mechanism is, is general and works in, in cases where there's otherwise incompatible uh, coacervates. So just to wrap up in um, what I just told you, so up here is, uh, is the mechanistic diagram for what's happening. And here's a little reaction. I'm a chemist, so I like to think about things in terms of simple reactions. So in some ways, you can think of this as a single displacement reaction. And with little versions, so little A minus, little oligoanions come in and displace the larger um, polyanion, the RNA, and allow it to go from a misfolded to a, to a folded state as shown here. And there's certain conditions that are special um, and they have little gold stars to indicate that they work really well. Um, and those can be um, for short um, oligoanions where we add large amounts of them or for the longer ones where they're charged matched. And so there's three conclusions or three takeaways. First is that the complex coacervates partition ribozymes very strongly, about 5,000 fold. The maximal rate of catalysis at the charge matched conditions occur at an intermediate polyanion length which is a type of Goldilocks effect. And the mechanistic basis for this seems to be a balance of strong RNA sequestration, which in, in the sense that when you have short polyanions, the RNA is strongly sequestered in a way that's good because it's inside the bioreactor, but it's kind of bad in the sense that the interaction's so strong that the RNA might not be able to fold very well. And the final conclusion is that if you add excess polyanions, you can enhance catalysis in complex coacervates. And it's very general. So short polyanions work the best. Um, they can be any kind of polyanion, carboxylates, phosphates, sulfates, they work well. It can be any kind of polycation. PDAC and oligoarginine work perfectly fine. The, the anions and cations can be biogenic or abiogenic. And it works in any ribozyme, or at least in two ribozymes. I showed you the data on the hammerhead. And we also have data on the hairpin ribozyme that I didn't have time to, to show you. And then finally, the excess short um, polyanions can rescue RNA catalysis and otherwise incompatible protocells. And so this comes from a collaboration of my lab, and these are the people who have contributed the most. Um, and in particular, the, the work um, that I showed today is primarily that of Raga Padile and Drew Venus, who this is a uh, lab, that's mine. Um, OK. 
Okay, I don't know how to stop it. Um, lab retreat photo, and here's Raghav hiding right there, and there's Drew, and then collaboration um, with, with, uh, with the Keating Lab, and this work has been funded by NASA as well as um, Raghav's uh, support has come from the Simons Foundation. I'd be happy to take some questions, thank you. We have time for one short question, so if your question is short, please keep your hand up. Hey, fascinating work, Bill. Uh, but my question is about the coassivates themselves. Is there a minimum uh, length for the, uh, the polymers that make the coassivate in order to get a coassivate? In other words, prebiotically, how long could, would you need these polymers to get in order to make a coassivate? Yeah, so that's ongoing work, and, and, and Sehun sitting right next to you has is, is been investigating that. And, and I think you can get a little bit shorter than, than 10, um, but certainly with, with the oligo um, D10, you get the coacervates. But as I said, the ribozyme is inactive, but then you can rescue that activity by adding more and more of that. And so, so I don't mean to sort of stand up here and say that this is the way that it happened, that the coacervates were necessarily made out of this anion or this cation. In some ways, it doesn't matter, right? So you can see lots of different anion-cation combinations can work. And basically, if the, if the uh, RNA in this case, but I'm sure it could be any, any um, informational polymer goes into there, if it goes in too strongly and interacts too strongly, it gets unfolded, and so then you kind of need to loosen that up. So, so I think you see here a specific example, but really the take home is that sort of the general principles for drawing it in, but not drawing it in too strongly to allow it to fold, and, and hopefully and robustly, and I would, I, I think, many, many different um, systems. All right, let's thank Phil again.